This week has seen the end of our annual BOLD program for another year. BOLD is a youth program that we've been running in the diocese for five years now. BOLD stands for Building Outstanding Leaders and Disciples. And so Anglican Youth Ministries works with a group of older teenagers. They gather monthly to develop a sense of community life together and also to receive some, some teaching and encouragement to help them to develop their sense of discipleship, of following Jesus, but also to begin to develop their innate leadership skills. It's a wonderful program, and each young people is able to identify through their year being involved with it, all sorts of ways in which they have grown and developed in, in those ways through the year. Uh, this week we've had their end of uh, year dinner at which they've celebrated the work that they've done and drawn that program to a close once again. It was exciting to hear from young people themselves about the ways in which they sense within themselves that they have uh, grown and developed. Uh, part of what they do during the year is a ministry exchange to Fiji where they are hosted by the Anglican Church there. Bishop Henry Bull uh, has taken a wonderful personal interest in this and every year Bishop Henry hosts a group um, from the Auckland Diocese uh, so they can get that experience of uh, a cross-cultural interchange and another, uh, another context within which they can work on their, their discipleship and leadership skills. One of the things that I said to them last night was that discipleship is not something we attend to over one year. It's a lifelong piece of work and if we ever imagine that there aren't ways in which we continue uh, to be challenged by God and to grow into our life in Christ then uh, I think we are starting to miss the boat. All of us at every stage in our life of discipleship and faith should always be open to the ways in which God is calling us to grow. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to be part of this week. Uh, and over those five years, I think that we have worked with probably 40 to 50 young people now um, to allow them to develop in this way. Uh, let's hold all of our young people in prayer uh, before God for all that they offer to our church now and all that we hope and pray they will be able to offer to us in the future. Good morning. It feels like a memory from over two years ago where Brendan's here and I'm standing to preach. Only the location's different. It's not Dargaville, it's Thames. And I have to say, it's nice to be here, to take a breath in the midst of doing this. <laughs> Blooming flies and cockroaches. When I kept coming across this reading in Romans 7, where Paul, in a very confusing and maybe comforting way, struggles with what he depicts as a conflict to do the right thing consistently, but finds the enemy of a satisfactory lifestyle is actually not outside him, but resident within him. And it confused me and it comforted me. How could Paul be confused about this? How could Paul be struggling like this to know what was right and not be able to do it? But it comforted me because, okay, I'm struggling with that too. So maybe if the great St. Paul can struggle with this, then I can struggle with it. These awful words, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. My, re my reaction was, ouch, Paul found that? Think about that for just a short time and you'll find that it resonates. It's like... We get no rest from this inner turmoil, this inner moral conflict. Strategies to handle that conflict sit in three different places. Ignoring the problem and just doing whatever feels right. 
or beating yourself up continually for getting it wrong and thinking of yourself as a miserable worm. Or subscribe to some formulaic checklist-based lifestyle, which is probably impossible anyway because every time you start going down the checklist you realise the things you've missed out. Fortunately, none of those things is adequate nor required. None of these give a long-term solution. The biggest problem is the practitioner, the participant, is the problem. Me, you. Basically, all those solutions will fail because they lack the one most important thing. What's that most important thing? Relationship. It's the relationship at the end of this reading that Paul calls us to. In verse 25a, he says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's an inherent understanding that, wait, here's all this conflict I'm going through, but here is where I find my place of rest. Jesus, for him, and for us, if only we would take it, is the calm centre of grace, right in the middle of this ridiculous place of conflict we find ourselves in, between what I want to do and what I end up doing. And Jesus, being the calm centre, invites us into that place, and we hear that in the Gospel This morning we see Jesus offering an invitation away from trying to impress each other and God help us, trying to impress God. That will never help us. What he's offering is freedom from the drive to perform. And Ellen, I don't mean acting. (laughs) But the drive to perform in our spiritual lives. The drive to look like we're doing the right thing always. To stop trying to do things the way we imagine to be the right way. Instead, Jesus addresses the tired and burdened with this invitation to rest with him. Not in some lonely place. I said to the congregation at St. James last week, that Jesus doesn't go through this whole agony, painful thing and the drama of resurrection just to push us out there and leave us to ourselves. Jesus invites invites us to himself to come with him, to be with him. There's no rest, there's no peace, there's no hope and there's no meaning anywhere else in any other program or or solution to the problem of struggling with this conflict in life. I remember in the first holidays we had when I went into ministry, it was at Tikaha on the East Cape. And I was standing on the beach at Tikaha and conscious of praying sort of, It always seems to be sort of. And all the stuff emptying out of me, all the work with young people, all the work rushing from one part of the parish to the other to preach, meeting in meetings and visiting in hospitals, all started to fall off me. As I stood still and rested with God. Do you hear this clearly? Do you hear that Jesus is calling us to himself? Pushing aside the barriers that we have always believed stood between us and God. Like God couldn't possibly accept me because if he really, because he knows what I'm really like and he can't possibly have me like that. Jesus is saying, I'm pushing that aside and inviting you in. He calls us not just to rest. Here's the amazing thing. In in the same sentence, within 
a few words of talking about rest, he's talking about work. But in a way that is quite different. And in helping a young man, a young pastor with supervision, it occurred to me that when Jesus invites us into his yoke, he's not actually saying, I want to put this on you and off you go. He's saying, this is the yoke that I'm in, and I want you to share this yoke with me so that what you do, you do with me. Where you go, you go with me. When you live through the struggles, I live through the struggles with you. You are not on your own. He's inviting us to join him in a means of service that becomes less difficult, less troublesome. It, you know, in, in a sense, for me, if there's not a joy in this service that you're engaged in or in this walk that you're engaged in, you're probably not yoked up with Jesus in this walk. It means when we go to him, when we rest with him, when we hear this invitation to be released from our burdens, he says, join me and you're working with me you're doing the things I'm doing. You're going to the places I'm going, like I said before. But we're doing them in his strength, in his power, in his enabling. We're not doing it on our own. And what's more, we're doing it in his character. There's a part in the Bible called the fruit of the Spirit, and I always get it wrong when I try to repeat it, so I won't but it's the characteristics of the Holy Spirit working within you. With Jesus, these things take place. Sometimes we can become very grumpy in our service because we're trying to do it ourselves. I know. <laughs> As a minister, I know how grumpy you can get. But here he's saying, do it with me. Do it our way. And he says, and you will find rest for your souls here in working with him, not just in resting with, which is important, and I have tried to tell that man in the funny clothes over there that several times, but resting with him is important. But also knowing, and this is the secret of any minister or priest who's enjoying the role of being a minister or priest, knowing that you're doing it with him, in his power, by his grace, in his understanding of the thing. So really that's simply my word to you today. The invitation from God to rest. Just like in the gorgeous story of Rebecca being welcomed into Isaac's camp. In Paul's going through the turmoil and returning to this place with Jesus where grace is found, peace is found, rest is found. And Jesus repeating that. Here you will find rest. Even working with me, you will find rest. So the invitation is still wide open. And I like to say something like, when you receive communion today, let it be you receiving again that wonderful yoke of the Lord drawing you forward with him, resting you in, with him and his company in his fellowship. Amen.